All right, welcome everyone to this week's Astroparticle Seminar. And I'm happy to have as our speaker, Harm Skörlene from uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen. He did his PhD uh, also at, at Radboud University. Then uh, Harm was a postdoc at the University of Hawaii and then a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. And now he's come back to his, his alma mater as an assistant professor. Uh, Harm is a, is a well-known expert on radio detection of high energy particles and gamma ray astronomy. He has been and continues to be part of uh, some of the most important high energy and ultra high energy astroparticle detectors like Pierre Auger and Hawk. And he's also involved in planning the next generation of detectors, uh, the Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory, which will be the subject of today's talk and, and the giant radio ray for neutrino detection. And he's been involved and has his fingers in, on, on different things. So uh, it's a pleasure to have him to, uh, here today. And he's going to talk to us about one such effort uh, regarding gamma ray observatories uh, for the next decade or so. So Harm, please take it away. Thank you, Mauricio. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think it's actually a, a pity that I cannot be there because I never been in Copenhagen. And I, it's definitely, I think it's highest ranked on my uh, cities that I still need to visit. <laughs> But uh, haven't gotten to it yet. So uh, uh, next time I hope to be there in person. Um, all right, but let's get, let's get started. So I'll be talking about the Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, or SWGO. Uh, it's probably the worst acronym of an experiment I ever worked for. Uh, a lot of my colleagues complain that they cannot, cannot pronounce it, uh, so they. Uh, it also goes under the name "we go" or "so we go," um, but uh, I will just uh, keep it at at SWGO uh, throughout this uh, talk. So I thought I would start with a uh, picture, um, and this is a picture of a location in the north of Argentina, uh, three hours uh, drive from the uh, city uh, Salta, and it's a three hours drive into the Andes Mountains. And this is one of the uh, potential sites of SWGO. As you can see, it's uh, not much grows there. Um, uh, it's a pretty harsh environment. Uh, it's cold at night, uh, uh, no, no animals. Um, and also for us, if you would be uh, standing on the opposite side of the camera looking at me, you would see that my uh, face was rather green when I was uh, taking this uh, picture. Uh, it, being at 4.8 km, 4 kilometers altitude is uh, pretty harsh on, on human beings. So I think, I hope that I can explain during this talk uh, why we would uh, build like a massive experiment on such high uh, altitudes and why we think it's worth uh, the efforts. Um, so this talk will be about uh, wide field gamma ray observatories. Um, and currently there are uh, a few of these experiments um, uh, operational. Um, and I thought I would kind of review some of the recent results that were really uh, gotten over the last five, six uh, years that are quite exciting uh, by these experiments. Uh, and uh, have this as a motivation for the uh, Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory to be built somewhere in South America. Okay, let's have a look on what uh, these Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatories uh, see. Uh, what I show here is a little bit, uh, a little movie uh, of the event rates uh, per every uh, two minutes. This is uh, uh, coming in. Uh, for the uh, Hawk experiment. And as the Earth rotates, uh, you see here now in the sky coordinates that we sweep kind of the beam that's uh, of uh, incoming events over the sky. So this is one day of events recorded uh, by the Hawk Observatory. And it can operate continuously. So it's, it's basically on all the time. And uh, as you can see, we at any given moment in time, we actually look at a rather large patch of the sky. You basically look at the overhead sky um, about up to 45 degrees from, from uh, Zenit. 
So you have this beam and you uh, move it over the sky because the earth rotates. And then you can just record and record and record. And then if you select out of the, all the events that you record, you select the events that you think are uh, possible uh, gamma rays, then you can make a, a gamma ray image on, of the sky. And that's what is shown here on the next slide. So this is the result of basically the Hawk Observatory uh, recording for uh, a little bit more over uh, 1500 uh, days. So it is just about uh, four and a half years of continuously stacking all the data. It continuously records on top of each other, but filtering out all the events that we think are not initiated by uh, uh, gamma rays, but uh, by uh, other particles like protons or other nuclei. If we do this, we can make this nice uh, image uh, of the sky and we see clearly several sources uh, popping up. If we go to a little bit more familiar uh, projection of the sky, we go to galactic uh, coordinates, we clearly see that most of our sources lay here in the, in the galactic plane. Um, and then we have a few sources here on this side. We're also near the galactic plane. Uh, the most uh, famous gamma ray source on the, on the far right of this slide is the, is the Crab Nebula. Um, and we also notice that the, uh, the sky outside the galactic plane is, uh, is rather empty. In this particular pro projection, you only see one clear source that is far away from the galactic plane, uh, but actually on the uh, edge of the uh, of this projection is, is one other source. So we have only two objects that are extra galactic, uh, uh, clearly seen um, by, by Hawk. So this is because the energy threshold of this uh, uh, ground-based gamma ray uh, observatories is, is about a uh, TeV. Um, at this energy, uh, extra galactic photons uh, cannot uh, uh, travel uh, over uh, large intergalactic distances anymore because they will pair produce and uh, lose the, uh, the energy on the way. So we only see a few uh, uh, nearby bright extra galactic sources and the rest are mainly uh, sources in our own galaxy. So I will highlight a few of these uh, individual sources um, in, the, in the next coming slides. Um, as Hawk is a surveying instrument, it's, it actually detected quite a, a, a few new sources, but I will talk about uh, sources that are of particular interest because they kind of mark new classes of sources. So uh, we, we already know from uh, many observations at uh, the, the TEV level by uh, imaging air to rank of telescopes that we have many sources uh, quite often related to pulsars, super, supernova remnants. Um, and Hawk found a few new and remarkable sources uh, in this. Uh, one of the most remarkable observations is uh, a very extended emission around a, a nearby uh, pulsar. Um, this pulsar goes under the name uh, Gaminga. Um, and in this little uh, cartoon here on the right, you see uh, where, where it's, it is with respect to Earth. Sorry, Earth is not drawn uh, to, uh, to scale here, of course. Uh, but it is about uh, 300 uh, parsec uh, from us. So it's uh, pretty near nearby. And when we look at this in uh, with Hawk, we see a very large emission region around uh, this uh, pulsar, as indicated in this uh, in this uh, map. For uh, comparison uh, of scale, we have here the moon, uh, and the moon is about half a degree. So this is the emission region is uh, many um, degrees apart. So what we see here is actually the emission from electrons being uh, accelerated by, um, um, by the pulsar, by the power of the pulsar and uh, uh, leaving uh, the system and going into the interstellar medium 
and there produce uh, inverse Compton uh, radiation. So by basically uh, uh, scattering of the uh, of the photon fields in the interstellar medium. Um, this particular nearby pulsar is, is interesting because uh, it can generate electron and positron pairs that can can travel away from uh, uh, from it and uh, might be the cause that we see an excess of uh, positrons um, at the Earth as measured by uh, satellites like uh, PAMELA and AMS. <coughs> oh, excuse me. However, by by looking at the emission around this uh, object, we can estimate how fast these electrons are moving away from um, from the pulsar. And uh, what we observe is that it's actually that they are moving uh, too slow to actually uh, reach us to uh, significantly contribute to the electron positron uh, flux. So we we learn something about the propagation speed of of uh, electrons in the interstellar medium, and it's uh, was quite a bit uh, lower than we uh, anticipated. Um, might be that the region around these objects is uh, not exactly the way we think uh, it, it is, so that it's more turbulent and um, therefore particles travel slower. Or it might be that we uh, always uh, uh, had a wrong estimation of how fast particles can move through interstellar uh, space. So it's, it's an interesting uh, object that uh, let us learn about the interstellar median and how particles uh, move uh, through it. Another object that uh, was quite interesting is uh, uh, microquasar uh, SS433, which was detected uh, the first time in uh, gamma rays uh, by Hawk. Um, this object has been known uh, in uh, many other wavelengths like X-rays and uh, 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 radio, uh, and it's a quite a yeah, special object in our own galaxy. So it's a, a binary system where, a, uh, where there's a heavy, uh, very heavy star, like uh, 30 solar masses. And next to it is a very compact object that accretes matter from, the, uh, from, from its companion and generates two, two jets. So it's kind of like a, a, a tiny, tiny AGN or active galactic nuclei or a micro case quasar, uh, like a quasar. Um, and it's the, really the first time that we can observe these, these jet-like structures at the uh, uh, many TeV uh, uh, gamma ray uh, uh, energies. So it's kind of an, a small, uh, a small version of, of, of the big accelerators in the universe, uh, we can now see uh, that it indeed accelerates up, uh, up to such energies that we see TeV emission from it. <coughs> for, for the big uh, accelerators like AGNs, uh, et cetera, in the universe, uh, we cannot observe the uh, much of the TeV uh, emission because as I said before, the, uh, the emission cannot uh, travel over these large distances. So this gives kind of a unique opportunity to study um, uh, in-jet acceleration and, uh, and emissions that uh, uh, accompany that uh, acceleration process. And then another thing that I wanted to highlight from the observations of Hawk is basically uh, the fact that it can observe photons up to uh, um, um, uh, up to energies uh, higher than ever before, and this is due to its very long exposure. As I said, it's it's basically on twenty four seven, and you just accumulate data and data and data. And due to this very long exposure, now the very uh, rare fluxes at the highest energies become uh, visible. So. If we just took that section of the galactic plane uh, that we saw in uh, one of the uh, earlier slides uh, on top, I, uh, I show here an emission that's roughly about, about uh, higher than one TeV accumulated. So you see many, many, many objects. But then if we go to higher energies, so in this case, we put a threshold of 56 TeV, um, the plane becomes, ra becomes rather empty, but still there are 
quite a few sources that we see above 50, 60 EV. Uh, uh, and even uh, three of them, we uh, see above 100 TeV reconstructed uh, energy. And, and this is quite unique. Uh, before these kind of surveying instruments, there was like uh, maybe one photon detected at about 90 uh, TeV. Uh, and now we actually see multiple sources above 100 uh, TeV. And this is the start of a new energy uh, regime in ast astronomy. And uh, we refer to this as the ultra high energy uh, gamma ray astronomy with the very high energy gamma ray astronomy uh, goes from 100 GeV to 100 TeV and 100 TeV above is the regime of ultra high energy gamma ray astronomy. Hard. This is, yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt? I think Marcus has a question here. Ah. Yeah, a very, very quick question. Uh, so these are very impressive results. Uh, can you remind me what is the angular resolution of Hawk in comparison to the size of these halos? Um, yeah, so at this uh, energy, uh, we uh, uh, reach about 0 0.2 degrees uh, angular resolution, more or less. Um, so we actually can, uh, for these uh, three uh, very high energy uh, sources, uh, so the ones above 100 TeV, uh, they turned actually to be still extended uh, with respect to our uh, uh, point source uh, or a point spread function. Uh, so and that's actually one of the su surprises that came out uh, a little bit is that we still see extended regions of emission in uh, at the very highest energy uh, at the very highest energies um, so the, the the moon that you indicated on your gaminga slide that's basically the the angular resolution of of hawk uh, that that would be the angular resolution at 1 tv um, it's uh, a fifth of the moon at uh, 100 tv or less okay. mm -hmm. thank you yeah, the moon was not to indicate the uh, the the point spread function there. It was more to indicate uh, the scale. Um, yeah. So okay. Harman, can I ask another question? Another yeah, please here. go ahead. Uh, is there uh, is there a source that you see at let's say fifty or hundred TV that you don't see at one TV? Um. Uh, there is. Uh, SS433, for example, we don't see at 1 T TeV. Um, it doesn't quite make it to the to the 50 uh, TeV, well, with, with certainty. Um, be because we here we put, put a cut on reconstructed energy, so th th there are a few events above that, that cut, but we don't, we cannot claim a, a five sigma significance or so, something um, there yet. Um, there is one uh, source that I will speak on the, maybe I can go to the next slide where we see the results from, uh, from Lasso um, that came recently out, which kind of are kind of the successor of these uh, results by Hawk. Uh, so Lasso is like Hawk and an air shower array is at very high altitude uh, in China, but it's significantly larger. Uh, so it has an area of uh, about a square kilometer where uh, Hawk is uh, in the order of um, 80,000 uh, 80, square meter. So it's uh, more than order of magnitude uh, uh, larger. Mm. And last year they came out with their first uh, results uh, from the square kilometer array and now confirm 12 uh, sources above 100 TeV. Um, and uh, even photons energy uh, estimated up to a PEV energy, so 10 to the 15 uh, electron volts. And one of the sources that is, uh, uh, as you asked, uh, Mauricio, um, that we don't see at the lowest energies is this uh, a Lasso uh, 2226 plus 6057. It uh, doesn't have any known counterpart at, at lower energies. Um, all the other so sources have uh, counterparts or at least are in emission regions with uh, very high uh, 
uh, with known uh, gamma ray uh, emitters. So yeah, the, the, uh, there's uh, most of them. They are uh, are known emitters. Um, quite a lot of them. The majority uh, have a very uh, uh, young pulsar associated with it. So it's probably the, the power source of the region. Um, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, and uh, this uh, new Lasso source that was uh, announced uh, last year is one of those uh, exceptions. Okay. So basically we have a lot of uh, um, interesting results from the in the last five to six years from uh, these ground-based wide field uh, gamma ray observatories. Um, but however, uh, the, they all were in the northern sky, uh, in the northern hemisphere. So we only see the northern part of the sky. And um, actually, probably the most interesting objects astrophysically are in the in the southern part uh, of the sky, are only accessible from the southern hemisphere. Uh, most notably, uh, the galactic center is just on the edge of the field of view of, of, of Hawk. Um, so we our sensitivity drops really, 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 really fast uh, there. Um, and if we think about particle accelerations, the galactic center is one of the prime uh, locations where we think that uh, uh, particle accelerations um, uh, up to a PV or even above uh, uh, could happen. Um, also, from the uh, southern hemisphere, uh, uh, we have uh, access to, uh, to look at the Fermi Wolves, uh, very extended region, which is this very extended emission is, is, is very suitable for a wide field of view uh, gamma ray observatory because uh, uh, with, with Imaging air triangle telescopes, you have a limited field of view, so you have to estimate your background in the same region of the sky. Um, it makes it very difficult to, to, to detect this very large scale emission. Well, uh, if you have a very wide field of view, then uh, you, you can measure the background and model it uh, correctly and subtract it to, to, to reveal these large scale emission regions. So we have Hawk and Lasso in the north. And uh, uh, kind of their recent results really motivated us to have uh, an observatory in, in the south. And this will be the Southern Whitefield Gamma Ray Observatory, hopefully. There will be still a small patch around the South Pole that might not be visible. Uh, so maybe we need uh, a gamma ray instrument on the South Pole as well if you want to have the full sky uh, monitored. And similar on the north. Okay, so I basically talked about results uh, and not yet about the uh, detection uh, principle uh, yet. So I, I would uh, like to spend uh, now one slide on a kind of uh, uh, talking about the detectors uh, uh, principle because the rest of the talk will be mainly about uh, uh, detectors and uh, what kind of detectors we are trying to build. Um, so basically how such a uh, wide field of view gamma ray observatory works is that we have uh, particle detectors at, at ground level, uh, but uh, at a very high altitude. Um, so now both Hawk and, uh, and Lasso are above uh, four kilometers. Uh, SWDO, we want to go even uh, a little bit higher, but uh, we don't think to go much higher than, than five kilometers. Um, so we measure if a incoming gamma ray from outer space hits the atmosphere, generates this uh, cascades uh, of uh, secondary particles. Uh, if it's a gamma ray, this cascade will mainly uh, uh, contains electrons and positrons and, and, and gamma rays again. And this, um, and this cascade, cascade will will propagate through the atmosphere, develop, and then uh, uh, 
can measure the particles of if your particle detector set at the ground. Um, and then you get kind of a, a footprint of particles on the ground. And from that, you can derive the, by looking at the uh, total uh, signal in this footprint, you get an estimate of the energy. And by looking at the time distribution of these signals, you can estimate the direction. Um, but of course, not only gamma rays are coming from uh, outer space, we also have uh, charged uh, cosmic rays, uh, protons, uh, helium, uh, heavier uh, uh, sub subatomic nuclei. Um, and we have to discriminate between uh, uh, these two. And uh, one way of discriminating is the fact that uh, in these uh, uh, particle cascades uh, initiated by a, a hadron, we, we find uh, a lot more muons in the uh, in the uh, footprint. So what we measure in our detector, and this is one way to discriminate is by looking at how many muons we we see in in, in gamma ray initiated showers versus uh, versus the uh, hadronic initiated showers. Then making uh, a selection, uh, you can make these gamma ray images of the of the sky. Of course, you can also just measure the Hadronic showers and do uh, cosmic ray uh, 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 physics with that, uh, but I won't be talking much about uh, that in this uh, presentation. Okay, so as particle detectors, we have these uh, water Cherenkov detectors. Uh, so basically, big water vo uh, volumes. Um, what happens? A, a particle from this particle cascade enters uh, the water volume, and then this water volume, volume has two. Uh, uh, purposes. Um, it's uh, uh, it's the medium that emits. So if a charged particle uh, uh, passes through, it emits a trank of light, and this uh, trank of light can then be recorded by a, a photon uh, sensor, typically a, a photon multiplier tube, a large photon multiplier tube. Uh, but also, it's uh, it works as a conversion uh, medium where in uh, 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 the uh, gamma rays in the shower are converted in electron positron uh, pairs that then emit strength of radiation and can be detected. So, and then you build a large array of these uh, water strength of detectors and, uh, and that is then your uh, full uh, observatory. And here we just sketch uh, uh, a, a particular uh, uh, array of detectors. This is not a not the one that we would like to build, but just to uh, to illustrate. Okay, so maybe if there are more questions about kind of uh, what we had, uh, that will be a good uh, time now before we get into a little bit more about talking about uh, SWGO in general. I think Enrico has a question. Uh, hi, uh, yes, just a curiosity on on the current sky observed by Hawk. I was wondering if there is uh, uh, any upper limit uh, or observation of the uh, high latitude uh, gamma ray sky uh, at TV or tens of TV. So what you see uh, as a background Oh, that's a good uh, question. Um, I think we are currently working on a publication on exactly uh, uh, this uh, uh, a question. Um, and right, so if you look at, for example, at lower energies at, uh, at Fermi, you, you have this, this kind of universal uh, a glow in, in every direction you, you look, you, you find gamma rays. However, this, this this emission drops off uh, rather uh, rather strongly uh, if you go to higher energies because basically the photons cannot propagate through the universe anymore. So this glow probably caused by uh, unresolved uh, um, uh, sources at very large distances basically doesn't make it to the Earth anymore. Um, yes, yes. I was wondering about uh, any background we can have in the closest neighborhood, say one kiloparsec hour halo. So, if there is any constraint on these emission regions surrounding the galaxy. Uh, 
yeah, so currently we, we're working on a publication there and um, uh, I, I wouldn't know the limits uh, out, out the top of my head. Um, but basically, uh, there, for ground, ground based uh, astronomy, uh, gamma ray astronomy, you get, you, you get another background uh, from uh, electrons and positrons that basically generate identical showers or almost identical showers to uh, gamma ray showers. Um, also, this one uh, uh, disappears rather, uh, rather quickly at, at tens of uh, uh, TeV. Um, it's a very steeply falling spectrum, and this is because uh, basically the electrons and positrons cannot propagate uh, through uh, before losing their energy anymore through the uh, intergalactic medium. Um, and uh, above that, it becomes uh, very, very uh, quiet in our uh, in our neighborhood. Um, and uh, I think Hawk currently is in the moment of producing current best limits in uh, above 10 TeV uh, diffuse uh, gamma ray emission in our in a local uh, neighborhood. Okay, is it a publication that we can expect to see out uh, in the range of uh, one year or so? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think it's an inter internal review. I uh, have to look it up, actually. Yeah. Okay, well, good Good to know, just uh, curious. Okay, thanks. Yep, you're welcome. Are there any more questions? I don't see any more hands, so please have just gone. Okay, so... Um, so this was kind of a review on on, on ground-based gamma ray uh, astronomy with with particle detectors. Uh, so now, what is SWGO? Um, so I try to summarize it kind of on this uh, slide. So it's an uh, international collaboration of scientists that aims to build a, such an observatory in the southern hemisphere. And this collaboration was really formed by kind of uniting several activities that were ongoing with people that want to do very similar things. Uh, and, and we want to uh, group them uh, together uh, to build one, one large observatory rather than uh, uh, having many initiatives on a, on a smaller scale. And, and this uh, happened about uh, two years ago now. Um, and currently, uh, uh, in the meantime, this the, the collaboration grew um, grew rather uh, rapidly. Up to forty seven institutes in twelve countries are now involved, uh, uh, plus uh, supporting scientists in in uh, several uh, other countries. So the idea of this collaboration is really to do a, a research and development activities. And uh, for that, we have kind of a time scheme, uh, uh, a plan for the coming for a three-year plan. And the idea is we we come at the end of this three-year period, we 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 have a proposal of the instrument that we want to to build and where the we we as a collaboration uh, subscribe to, and then we try to convince funding agencies uh, to give us the money and build it and do awesome science. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, a little bit of a management slide. Um, so the way uh, SWGO is uh, is organized is we have these uh, uh, working groups, which, uh, as they say, uh, do a bulk of the of the work. And uh, we have uh, we have five of them. We have uh, one group that works on uh, on outreach, uh, both uh, internal and and external. Um, um, we have a, a working group that uh, looks at a detector, so really the, the hardware uh, of the detector. Uh, there's a working group on uh, analysis and uh, simulations, uh, a working group on uh, uh, really looking at the, the science case uh, of the experiment. And then we have a, a working group that uh, tries to find um, a, the site where we will uh, build this uh, observatory. So all these working groups um, have then are kind of overseen by this uh, steering committee that have uh, representatives of the individual countries involved uh, in there. 
and they request things from the from the working groups and, and we report to the steering committee and in, in addition to this there's an advisory committee which consists out of members of other uh, mainly senior members of other uh, big collaborations that uh, advise on uh, specific matters if uh, if requested and uh, basically give give back, uh, back feedback on both the working group work and, and the steering committee work. So to, together we made a, uh, a plan um, and uh, uh, to uh, have this three years uh, research and development phase. And uh, here on the right, you see the kind of the milestones of this, uh, of this plan. Uh, the first one was to establish the plan, uh, it was a good, it was a good plan because then we could take one milestone off. Uh, uh, but basically, you see here several uh, steps. Uh, I won't go in a lot of uh, details to all of them. Um, we're kind of now currently kind of midway of this uh, research and development plan. And of course, since uh, uh, COVID uh, happened, uh, basically shortly after we formed our uh, collaboration, uh, there are a few things that slipped the, the original schedule uh, a little bit, especially actually the uh, the site uh, shortlisting. So we we're looking at several sites. Uh, it's going slower than expected because of all the uh, uh, regulations uh, with respect to uh, travel uh, makes it very hard to to do to do site visits, uh, etc. In the last uh, couple of years. Okay, on the global scheme, we are looking at three uh, different design options, or maybe I should say concepts. Um, and these are summarized here. We either all are based on the water rank of uh, detection technique, um, but the way we implement them is different. Um, so we're considering either using individual tanks that sit on the surface that can be made of metal or of plastic. This is the way a hawk was built, for example. Or we can use a, uh, a artificial pond, so make, make a water a volume or swimming pool, uh, and then make units uh, in this uh, uh, a pond. Um, this is kind of what, uh, what but lasso, at least the, the inner part of the lasso uh, detector is, is like this. And then we are considering actually to use a natural lake and uh, put our detectors in that. That might have the advantage that we don't have to build uh, a lot of infrastructure and might result in cheaper units. And um, therefore, uh, we might be able to build a, a larger detector if we do it this way. Uh, so these concepts we are uh, exploring. Uh, but then there, then there are also the, the unit dimensions, the photo sensors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, we know how to, how to build it, but we are trying to optimize the design in, in this uh, uh, phase. And, and for that, we have to explore uh, quite a few things. Um, and of course, if you build a water shrink of detector, uh, the, the site, and the detector are not completely decoupled. If you want to build something in a lake, you of course need a lake. Um, so currently we are investigating several uh, sites in, uh, in the Andes, in uh, South America. Um, and we have sites in uh, Peru, uh, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. And uh, basically Bolivia and Peru are a little bit more towards North, uh, the sites typically have more uh, uh, more water than the uh, uh, than the southern sides, um, which means that different detector uh, concepts can be uh, implemented uh, probably there than uh, in, the, in the south. Uh, all of them are at very high altitudes. Um, uh, and currently, we are in in process of trying to characterize each of these uh, sites so that we can make a well-informed uh, decision uh, later on in, in, in which of these uh, sites uh, we get, uh, we ranked uh, as the highest or as our preferable site. 
Um, on some of these sites, there's some infrastructure because there are other experiments. Um, uh, for example, in the Chile, one is next to the uh, Alma site we are considering. So it's a lot of infrastructure. Um, uh, on some specific uh, ones like uh, the lakes that we might want to use uh, for the for the natural lake solution, we, we uh, are performing measurements on, on water depth. Um, and, uh, and we try to collect as much data as we can remotely. Um, and uh, this year, uh, hopefully a few uh, uh, weather stations will be uh, deployed on the individual side. So we get uh, more uh, in situ uh, uh, data. Um, so basically the site working group is, is collecting all this data, doing the characterizations. And then on basis of that, we, we as collaboration, hope to get a, a preferred uh, site for our experiment. Um, so the detector working group is uh, doing a lot of uh, prototyping of all the individual elements. And on this slide, you just see uh, a lot of pictures and big uh, water tanks um, uh, that either are commercially available or you have to construct yourself. Um, at the Max Planck, in Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, we actually built a, uh, an artificial lake as you, you can see it here in the, on the top right, you can see it uh, from the side. So this is like a big water volume in which we are trying to, to deploy this, uh, this, this water or the, the water tranquil detector in, in the lake. We're trying this, uh, this concept because it's a new concept, it's not, never been done before. So it needs quite a lot of prototyping, but as I said, it might be the cheapest solution to build a big detector. So it might be worth the, the prototyping and the extra effort. Um, so a lot of work is going on, uh, characterizing photon sensors, but also the full timing calibration, uh, data acquisition um, uh, are currently being, uh, being, being tested and prototyped. Um, right, so we have many, many options uh, um, that we would like to test because we would like to build the best detector for, for uh, a unit of money. Um, so what we do, what we did is we have to have a kind of a reference point to what we want to compare the different design options. Um, and to do so, we made a reference configuration. Um, and here you see kind of out of our design options, uh, the ones that we selected to put in this reference configuration. So uh, this is a uh, Detect the configuration that we are kind of confident that we can build. Uh, we can we know the, the cost of the individual elements. Uh, so we can also uh, get the cost of this configuration. And then we can compare it to other uh, designs. So here you see kind of the things that we selected from all our options. But let's go to the next slide just to have a look at how it uh, looks like. Um, so the idea is that we have a, a double layer, uh, double layered uh, water tranquil detector. So we have in a top compartment, a photomultiplier looking up, um, uh, seeing all the light of all the particles that, that, that enter in the water volume. And then we also have a bottom compartment uh, where we uh, see uh, that mainly uh, functions to uh, tag uh, muons, as muons are a sign of hydronic uh, showers. By having a clean signal of muons, we can uh, uh, basically select the hydronic showers and then reject them to only keep the gamma ray uh, initiated showers. So basically it's to do uh, effective background uh, rejection. Of this particular design, we uh, designed an, uh, an array. Um, with a large uh, inner detection uh, area where we have a high uh, packing factor, 80% uh, of the ground covered by these uh, water tranquil detectors, and an outside to increase the area uh, to, to measure, to go to the highest energies to, uh, because the flux is low there. Uh, we have a sparser array with a fill factor of uh, 8%. And this is kind of what we did on. Uh, yeah, of a piece of, uh, with a pen and a piece of paper, 
uh, we designed this array and we uh, uh, then went on and estimated the cost of this uh, detector and built of uh, in simulations this, this reference configuration. Um, in the meantime, we're also thinking about other designs. Um, one uh, alternative uh, to this double layer where we use this bottom compartment to uh, to tag the muons. Uh, uh, we could also imagine in making a more shallow uh, uh, tank, but with uh, uh, more photomultipliers, uh, photosensors in, in the bottom, and actually using uh, uh, both timing and amplitude uh, distributions of signals uh, to uh, also tag muons. So instead of of, of shielding uh, uh, the uh, bottom compartment uh, uh, to, to get a clear moon signal. Here you use the kind of the full complexity and, and, and geometry and optimize that geometry to identify muons. Um, uh, looks also promising. Uh, and at the end, it will be a uh, performance of cost trade-off to decide uh, which which design we will be able to. So as I said, we are testing uh, uh, actually many configurations. So we can also scale the uh, the water rank of detectors, uh, make them bigger, make them smaller, uh, remove uh, the bottom layer. Uh, and then is the question, how are we gonna uh, distribute our detectors? So, um, uh, the array layout, is it beneficial to have a very dense inner array or can it have like lower density? Um, at the outside, uh, can we have, uh, can we, can we have a gradient in density and then increase our sensitivity to the, towards the highest energies? Uh, uh, how low can we go in this density until it's not uh, useful anymore? Um, this is the moment, this is the stage where, where we're at now. We, we defined a set of configurations that we're going to test and a set of array lay layouts. And based on, on the outcome of those simulations, we're going to make an next iteration to optimize the design. So just for, for fun, I thought I would shoot some uh, a shower so that you get an uh, idea how it would look in our detector. So in this left uh, figure, I took a, uh, a vertical air shower or a vertical gamma ray and, and shoot it right towards our detector. And, and you see that it, uh, it nicely spreads out from, from the center. Um, uh, and then later on, it gets hit further uh, towards the side. Uh, so particles coming in later. So this kind of this, this curved uh, shower front uh, that we uh, it's well known from from air shower physics. So you nicely see that, um, yeah. And I just like to show some animated gifs. So on the on the right we now have a um, a fifty TeV uh, gamma ray, so a lot higher energy than on the left. And this one sweeps now over over the full detector, so an inner and outer array. Um, and you can see many, many thousands hits of, uh, uh, of uh, particle uh, detectors. So if you just take uh, a few stills of this, of these uh, animations, uh, uh, with different events, um, here a 600 GeV uh, a gamma ray, and on the right a 14 TeV a gamma ray, both at 35 degrees seemed angle, and uh, color coded is the, the arrival time. You see that even at 600 GeV, so this is kind of the on the on the lower side of um, of the energy regime where this detection technique works, uh, you still get a very large footprint. So uh, uh, the the particles are still very distributed over the over a large area, which means that having a large area really helps to contain the events. Uh, and this helps uh, the quality of reconstruction and determining if it was a gamma ray or hadronic uh, uh, shower. Um, and if you build a, a large array, this is uh, becomes uh, possible or the accuracy at lower energy will improve uh, significantly. Um, so 
we're kind of in the process of exploring uh, uh, some phase space of detector uh, options. Um, but in the meantime, we, we kind of set a, a, a goal uh, sensitivity um, or basically a range of sensitivities that we think is kind of uh, achievable. Um, the, our goal is to significantly improve over Hawk. Um, uh, but also uh, uh, we want to be co complementary to CTA and uh, and Lasso uh, and to be uh, complementary uh, uh, to Lasso you need to be at least uh, uh, have a similar performance or maybe even better uh, performance than than Lasso. So in this figure here on the right, this, this uh, differential point source sensitivity uh, figure, we kind of sketched in this this orange sheet uh, the phase space that we are trying to explore with uh, on the flux sensitivity that we that we can get uh, with the lower part of this outline being the very optimistic uh, regime where we have uh, a significant improvement over the uh, uh, both the angular reconstruction and the background rejection. Um, um, and uh, this red curve uh, called Strawman is, is kind of now our conservative uh, uh, estimates that we can do, uh, which corresponds to basically just scaling up a hawk um, to a larger scale. Uh, so probably the truth will lay somewhere in between, and and we yeah, and we're currently trying to figure out where we where we can land in this. Uh, this band. So that's the flux sensitivity. The other thing already someone hinted at is, is the is the resolution. Um, so our goal is to really improve upon the uh, resolution and we have uh, some preliminary studies that uh, are quite uh, promising uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, so we think that we can really improve upon upon Hawk. Um, I'm not sure if we can get close to the theoretical uh, limit that was uh, calculated uh, uh, about two years ago by uh, Werner Hoffmann. Um, but yeah, we at the highest energies, we might even get close to uh, CTA-like uh, uh, performances on, at the highest energies. If everything goes very well, uh, that remains to be seen. Okay. So uh, a few last slides about uh, uh, science cases um, that we are hoping to tackle with this uh, uh, observatory. So since it's, it's a since we measure all the time, it's a good uh, monitor of the sky, which makes that uh, transient sources uh, like gamma ray burst or AGN activities are uh, a very interesting to um, to search for. Uh, of course, the difficulty here is low energy uh, sensitivity. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we only have two extragalactic sources uh, at the moment in Hawk. Uh, uh, for Lasso, it's uh, still early days, but uh, so far they uh, didn't see any any more. Um, so, one of the most difficult things is to improve up, upon the low energy uh, sensitivity. We have a few good ideas on how to do it, but uh, it remains to be seen if it's uh, Achievable. Then galactic accelerators, spectrotrons, so basically very high energy uh, uh, emission we are looking at. Uh, this is kind of, in a sense, easy. We know how to uh, how to do it. Um, so that will be exciting, especially in the southern hemisphere with the galactic center. So galactic accelerators, um, uh, extended sources, these TV halos around these pulsars, very interesting. Diffuse emission uh, is one uh, a key science case. Uh, also fundamental physics, uh, uh, being able to look at the, the galaxy, uh, galactic center uh, uh, at high energies is uh, seriously constrain uh, annihilation from dark matter. But then also non uh, uh, gamma ray physics like cosmic rays uh, uh, physics, uh, Doing dipole uh, measurements and and trying to actually uh, uh, 
uh, separate out different mass groups within, within the uh, uh, on the sky um, uh, to do a, a mass resolve dipole measurement is one of the uh, key targets. For this, we need to know very well the the uh, uh, cosmic ray composition on top of the uh, of the atmosphere, which might be possible if you have sufficient muon uh, tagging. So there are a few publications out on uh, on these uh, uh, topics. Uh, so on, on GRBs, uh, it looks promising, especially uh, with the recent developments in uh, from the IACTs uh, seeing um, gamma ray burst. Uh, if this one of these, if, for example, the uh, GRB that was detected in 2019 by by Magic would happen inside our field of view. Uh, uh, current sensitivity estimates uh, would, would say that we would definitely have seen it. Uh, with the advantage that we um, uh, that we would catch the, the prompt phase of the uh, emission uh, then as well. So we don't have to slew towards the GRB, we can slew the Earth. Um, so it would just happen. Uh, and that may, means that we uh, would see the prompt phase. Uh, follow up on uh, on long term uh, AGN uh, activity uh, in the light of uh, recent uh, possibly correlation between neutrinos and um, uh, AGN activity is of course very interesting with new neutrino observatories uh, coming online or the upgraded uh, neutrino observatories in the uh, at the same time scale that SWO will be uh, operational. Okay, this is basically what I just said about uh, synergies with neutrino um, observatories. Um, uh, one of the things is also to map out the uh, diffused emission from our uh, galaxy and uh, trying to separate out the inverse Compton emission uh, uh, versus the uh, pion decay emission and then use that, uh, use the pion decay emission to correlate against uh, neutrino uh, events either measured with uh, ice, ice cube, ice cube gen two or uh, game three net. And as I said, the, uh, the galactic center is a prime suspect for uh, dark matter annihilation. And uh, here is one of the cases where it would work very nice together with uh, Fermi and CTA uh, SWO with uh, more sensitivity at the highest energy we will be able in uh, certain channels to kind of exclude uh, uh, dark matter annihilation uh, well uh, into the thermal relic uh, cross uh, section or uh, 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 far below it. So that's that, that will be very interesting to see um, if we are hopefully surprised what happens in the in the region around the uh, galactic center. Okay, to conclude, um, the Sun and Sky needs a wide field, uh, very high and ultra high energy gamma ray instrument. Uh, it will be complementing existing observatories in the Northern Hemisphere. There will be strong uh, synergies with uh, CTA uh, and next generation uh, neutrino telescopes. Of course, also gravitational wave uh, follow ups will be an important uh, part of the multi-messenger astronomy uh, part of the projects. Um, and, and there's many other interesting uh, science to be done. Uh, the project is going um, uh, quite well. Um, so we advancing towards the design. Uh, uh, despite the uh, pandemic, of course, there are a few things that are, are very hard to do with this uh, pandemic. Uh, but in general, we do. Uh, Pretty good. We only had a one in-person meeting with our collaboration, which is kind of sad. Uh, hopefully we have one uh, soon in person again. Uh, we're very open uh, to new uh, partners and new ideas. The design is definitely not finalized yet. Uh, yeah, and we look forward with, uh, to strong partnerships with other experiments like LASSO and, and CTA. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Harm. This was interesting and comprehensive. So is there any question from the audience at this point? I think Marcus has one. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Ham. Um, I was wondering, you um, talked about this different uh, possibilities of uh, immersing these bladders in, in a lake and to, to build, like, like Hawk does it with these huge uh, kind of uh, tanks, I guess. Um, is there any advantage of building very large? I, I can imagine that in particular, if you have very large bladders, you want to have some sort of support structure in water. So the pressure of water. Is there any other advantage why you want to go large in size for these uh, bladders? Could this be an um, advantage? Yeah, so large in size for a bladder means basically the overall design is cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you make your 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 water volumes bigger, you need less material on the outside to, to make the unit. And that reduces the uh, the price per uh, unit meter. And then you can build more. Uh, you can cover more ground or more area uh, with detectors, which which will help in, in reconstruction and um, and just in, in, in coverage. However, there's also a downside uh, of, uh, of large detectors is that uh, uh, the intrinsic uh, timing resolution uh, decreases, right? So it's not good for your uh, angular reconstruction. Um, advantage is that in a large volume, a muon track is very long. So it helps if your camera had one separation. So there's there's a lot of trade-offs. And, mm -hmm. and at the end, we don't know the, the correct answer uh, yet. We have ideas, but we really need to uh, study it in detail simulations, I think. Especially because, uh, especially because there's this price tag involved, right? So, so what we do is we actually, um, uh, we have this reference configuration and that configuration we, we calculated how much it will cost in total. And then what we do is we make other configurations with other detectors to keep the overall cost the same. So that we can have like some kind of uh, uh, yeah uh, performance per square meter or something uh, uh, at the end uh, uh, per, per dollar. <laughs> Gamma rays per dollar. Yeah, like yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what we are we're trying to do in our optimization uh, strategies. Yeah. Uh, one other question, if I may, uh, I know that. Well, if I re remember correctly, Lasso had actually also these uh, Trankov uh, telescope arrays. Is this something that you also consider for um, SWGO or Zifco, Zofco, or <laughs> Swigo? Swigo. Um, uh, yes, um, but not as the baseline design. Um, so currently, we are we're, we're trying to get the uh, baseline design kind of worked out uh, and then there will be uh, options for um, enhancements and, uh, and other things. It's, it seems silly not to have some uh, imaging uh, trank of telescopes uh, at the sides at, uh, at the most part of the, of the cost um, mm -hmm. uh, just for cross-checking and uh, yeah, and many reasons why you would like to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this stage, we, uh, yeah, we're focusing on on the baseline uh, design uh, first. Um, so not much prototyping going on, on on that aspect. But there are groups in the collaboration that that are interested in uh, pursuing this uh, in the yeah. future. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And uh, I have a question, if I may. Uh, if you go to your slide. 24. Uh, I was curious about. Arm. Yeah, sorry. I'm. Um, oh, you're going I, to... I, I clicked away the presentation and I'm just oh, trying fine. to figure so, out. No, uh... I just noticed that the that the lasso has sensitivity to, to the highest energies, whereas uh, Suigo seems to stop before. And I was wondering why why what is preventing the the Suigo design. From achieving that same sensitivity that lasso has at the highest energies. Okay, let me just bring up the uh, yeah. uh, the slide. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think it's it's this one, right? Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Um, 
we are actually uh, um, uh, seriously thinking about uh, uh, having a high energy uh, enhancement. And it's kind of indicated here with these with this dashed uh, <laughs> dashed lines. Um, and at the end, it all comes boils down to uh, two things. There's uh, uh, the area that you will cover on the ground um, and the background rejection that you are capable of, um, of achieving over that, that area. And uh, Lasso has a, a very impressive background rejection that's at 100 TV and above of it's uh, throws away 10 to the, to the five background events and keeps one gamma ray. Um, and it's capable of doing that because it has this very uh, big coverage of uh, uh, buried muon detectors. Um, so this is, of course, not cheap. Uh, so, so we are thinking about doing something but uh, trying to uh, cost optimize. And we're actually uh, um, uh, talking to uh, our colleagues from from Lasso um, on on how to achieve that, and they they have interest uh, as well in maybe uh, joining the, uh, the the project. Um, but we are just like exploring ideas at the moment uh, with them. But yeah, the idea is to actually go to this to this high highest energies as well. Sure. Thanks. Um, let's see if there's another question in the audience. I don't see any other hand, but uh, I, I can't resist to ask, uh, what is from your shortlisted sites, uh, do you have any preference? And I'm very, it's a very loaded and biased question because I prefer one over the other three. <laughs> um, well, I have the, um, all right, let's, let's pick it up. Um, I've actually uh, the luck to be, to be, I've traveled quite a lot through South America uh, about 10 years ago, and I accidentally went to, to two out of the four sites uh, here, or very, very near. Um, uh, so I've been in Bolivia uh, and Argentina, uh, and actually I, I also have been to not this site in Peru, but, uh, but another site. Uh, at the end, uh, I don't know. Um, there are up and down sides to, to each side. Um, and uh, I don't have a, uh, a preference. I like the food everywhere. <laughs> and I cannot say, uh, yeah, I wouldn't go to, 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 to put a preference at this stage, I think. That's fair. <laughs> All right, well, I get my fingers crossed. Uh, I think you're. I think you're hoping for Peru. I yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I there have been some. Uh, Peru has as an advantage that there is plenty of water, um, which might be uh, crucial. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Uh, I don't see any other question, but uh, thank you so very much, Harm, for giving us this uh, this view of what's to come, um, and thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, we'll see each other in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Harm. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Harm. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.